All right, so today we're going to be talking about conservation of macro fungi. We'll talk a little bit about um, conservation of fungi in general, uh, but yeah, we're going to talk about conservation of macro fungi, concentrating on Alberta and the Prairie Provinces. So we'll kind of touch on uh, international uh, stuff as well as we go through. So the uh, general gist of our talks here of what we're going to do is we're going to start off with um, some introductions and definitions uh, then we're going to go into how do we protect species so what is kind of the legal instruments and stuff that we have to do species protection in Alberta uh, and Canada uh, then we'll kind of talk about the status of conservation in Alberta and Canada and what are the challenges that we have to getting some more work done this way and some proposed next steps as to how we can get things going in this in this world. So starting off with some definitions, first of all, what are macro fungi? Um, so macro fungi are species um, that have species of fungi that have fruiting bodies that are visible to the naked eye. Okay, so you can see them. There's tons of micro fungi out there. Many, many, many species of micro fungi that really um, don't form much of a reproductive structure that you can see or else they're really, really tiny. If you go into the woods and you pick up a leaf and you see that it's got little black dots on it or you, you know, you see uh, little bits of filaments or little tiny powdery things, um, growing on on leaves or wood so those are many many of the species of microfungi that are out there um, because we're trying to narrow things down if you um, want to talk about the the taxonomic groups it includes the two divisions basidiomycota and ascomycota so basidiomycetes and ascomycetes although there is one zygomycete which is a group that includes um, bread molds and stuff that is generally in included um, and generally speaking, we're talking about things that are like our mushrooms that you would see um, that most people would think about in cup fungi as well as the underground fungi, the, the truffles and the conchs growing on the sides of trees, things that form in crust structures on the sides of wood um, and, um, and then a whole bunch of other different growth forms like corals and spatulas and you name it. Um, Generally, when we're, we're using the definition of macro fungi, we're not going to include lichens. Um, we'll talk a little bit about lichens in a minute, um, but we generally don't use lichens in that, even though they are fungal and they are macro. Um, and they also ex exclude things that are only causing diseases like our rusts and our smuts, even though they can produce some fruiting bodies that are big enough to see. Of course, doing this is artificial trying to decide what's a macro fungus, fungus and not is, is you know, really up to, up to interpretation. Um, when I was working on a, the project and trying to, um, trying to decide which species to include and exclude, um, you know, do I decide on species that are in a family? Do, that has some macro members? Do I have to look at each species? And that would take way too long to do a project like that and find out the size of fruiting bodies of each of the thousands of species that I'm having to assess, just not reasonable to do. So um, when I did it, I kind of narrowed it down to families that have macro members and just working on those families. Um, but yeah, again, might be subject to debate as to what you want to call a macrofungus or not. So now we're going to talk for a bit about macrofungi. Why are they important? Why do we should, would, should we bother with trying to conserve them or worry about them? Um, so of course, one thing that you want to mention if you want to note tell somebody why something is important is you say it's important to something else. All right, and so in this case, it's important to plants and to the plants in the forest. Um, it's vital to the survival and growth of terrestrial plants. Um, so 90% of 
plants have what they call mycorrhizal associations. And so what mycorrhizal associations are, they're a mutually benefic beneficial relationship where a tree or other plant um, is, getting, uh, is getting extra surface area from the filaments that form the main part of the fungus. And those filaments are all throughout the soil and all throughout dead pieces of wood and all throughout um, almost every part of the ecosystem that's out there except for living tissue and sometimes even in living tissue um, as endophytes or as parasites. So, um, so this relationship, the, the plants now have access to this huge network of fungi that, um, that are in the soil and they can use that to gather more nutrients out of the soil. Uh, fungal filaments are only one cell wide. If you can imagine how tiny that is, all these filaments that are one cell wide, whereas plant roots are quite thick. And so having this access to get these extra nutrients is, is so vital to their being able to get enough to, to be able to grow effectively. Um, what do the fungi get out of it? Well, fun, um, fungi can't photosynthesize, so they get the benefit of getting the sugars and energy from the plants. Uh, we've also uh, only discovered really in the last 10 years and even more so in the last five years, the true extent of what's going on with these mycorrhizal associations. And we find out that we're not only having a one fungus, one tree or one fungus, two trees, but often many different species of plants linked together. And not only is a fungus having that relationship with the tree, but it's or, or the other plant is actually perhaps it, in, in many cases, it's transferring nutrients or energy from a bigger tree to help a smaller tree grow. And it's acting as a communication network. So it's allowing, um, uh, allowing somehow there to be communication between plants so that if this plant is, um, is getting attacked by insects, it somehow transfers that information to um, the other nearby plants that are hooked up to this fungal network and saying, hey, make sure you put some more defense compounds out. So it's, it's so important for these ecological relationships. And traditionally ecology, we're all about the competition. You know, this guy's gonna beat that out for light and that sort of thing. And we're finding out that through these fungal networks that there's a lot more cooperation going on in the, in the forest than, um, than we ever realized. Um, and there are some plants that are completely reliant on fungi for their growth. If you've ever seen um, that plant in the top quarter there, um, that's called Indian pipe. And uh, it is a species that entirely lives off of, it basically parasitizes mycorrhizal fungi. So it's, it's, it's uh, completely growing uh, on with all of its energy coming from the fungi. If there are no fungi, there are no Indian pipes, there are no coral root orchids, um, there are no, um, you know, there's an, a whole group of, um, of, of fungi or of vascular plants that are entirely reliant on in, um, mycorrhizal fungi. And you look in, um, in, poor ecosystems, nutrient poor ecosystems. You'll see plants like Labrador tea and bog cranberry and that sort of thing in these ecosystems. And they have their own mycorrhizal networks that are uh, specific to those groups called the ericaceous mycorrhizal fungi. So there's, there's a lot going on here with these mycorrhizal relationships. And um, in the tropics, um, a lot of the uh, fungi that are involved in these are species that don't form mushrooms, but in the temperate and boreal forests, most of the associations that we see uh, going on in the forest are with mushroom forming fungi. So in this case, it is the macro fungi that we see in the, in, the, in the form of these mushrooms, like the ones that you see in the bottom corner, that's a species of Russula. Um, and that's a one of, of thousands of species of mycorrhizal fungi that we have in, um, in Canada. Um, other really important roles that fungi play, um, they are extremely important decomposers. 
Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about why decomposition is, is generally not considered a big deal, but ladies and gents, it's a big deal. If decomposition is not happen happening effectively and in the right, right rates, it totally screws up ecology and the ability of organisms to um, survive in their habitats. Um, uh, of course, the fun macro fungi themselves provide food for many different species. Um, so you can see the little uh, northern flying squirrel in the bottom corner. So my my uh, master's supervisor, Randy Kura, worked on a project where he got a whole bunch of um, a flying squirrel stomachs and found that throughout the whole year, their majority of their diets was made up of um, of, of macro fungi. So e even though you don't think of squirrels eating fungi so much, yeah, it's a huge part of their diets. And there's a lot of other smaller organisms, flies, beetles, whatnot. We may not like them when we, when we go to pick our, our mushrooms and we find bugs in our mushrooms. Um, but yeah, there are whole groups of insects that are entirely reliant on macro fungi to, to, um, to live and to grow. Another thing is if you're interested at all in trying to um, uh, combat climate change, um, recent studies have shown that in northern forests, macro fungi, and well, fungi in general at least, are doing the, the vast majority of carbon sequestration in the forests. So there's, uh, you can think of the huge northern boreal forest in the area that it covers, but it's the fungi, not the plants, that are doing most of the storage of carbon in the soils. Um, why should we, wear, we care about conserving them if there's so many of them? Well, there are certain species that are extremely pollution sensitive and much more so than even the plants that we are aware of right now. So that what that means is that, um, that when we're trying to set pollution limits to what we think is okay for say alteration of pH in the soil or um, too much fluorine in the soil by a fertilizer factory or too much whatever that we're worried about. A lot of times these limits are not being set with fungi in mind and so we may cause the um, local or per even permanent extirpation of fungi in the areas where we are completely unaware that we're having a significant effect on, um, on the fungi that are being affected. Another use that we see macrofungi being used for nowadays is in the area of bioremediation, uh, where we're using fungi to clean up soils, whether it be from things like um, um, toxic heavy metals to, uh, you know, dangerous or high concentrations of things like petroleum or other related products in the soil. Um, so there's another benefit to humans of having a good diversity of macrofungi where we can, we can know which ones to use. And a lot of times that's done by, um, that bioremediation is done by removing the fruiting body. So we have to have macrofungi in order to do that. And last but not least, um, I, I, I kind of started off with kind of talking why they're important to other things, but honestly, when you think about it, every organism ought to have the right to survive, the, the right to not to be made extinct um, or extirpated from an area by humans. So there is an innate value, I believe, to having macrofungi um, around and that they have their own value just because they are what they are. They are what whether you believe God or evolution created, they have uh, a reason and a purpose of their own. And we don't necessarily have to justify um, keeping them around by saying they're important to something else. And I do see some people typing, but I'm just having a hard time getting that view here. When I put on my presenter view, I lost, uh, I lost, my ability to see the chat here. I apologize for that. If somebody is typing into the chat, just um, if somebody could let me know uh, using their audio, I'd appreciate that. Hi, Michael, it's Karen. Just a Hi, Karen. Question. 
what do they do with the fruiting body after they pick it, after they do the remediation? Oh, well, then they would dispose of it in a hazardous, hazardous waste facility, but it's concentrating it now out of the soil, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a hazardous waste by then. Yeah, exactly. So okay. you wouldn't want to pick those mushrooms. Or eat, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Michael, you just touched a little bit on uh, the relationship of fungi to orchids. Yes. Uh, you, don't have, you don't have to go into it now, but could I contact you later on? Because uh, we have orchids growing here in Yellowknife, and you can see the fungi growing with them. And yeah. I need to know, get some references and things like that. Would that be possible? I suppose so. I'm not like an expert on that particular topic. I just know um, just point me in know a the direction. importance. <laughs> yeah, or orchid seeds don't even have any nutrient stores in them. They're these tiny things that look like dust and they are entirely reliant. They don't even germinate if a fungus doesn't penetrate their seed and, um, and start to try to invade it. And then the, the orchid um, actually kind of, in a, in a sense, parasitizes a fungus mm -hmm. and takes the nutrients and energy out of the fungus as, um, as often the fungus think is, it thinks it's trying to parasitize it. And it turns out that it's parasitizing the fungus. So. Being parasitized. Well, yeah, just any references I'd really appreciate because... Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, not a problem. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So, yes, I am going to talk for a minute about lichens because they are another passion of mine. I love lichens um, and I've done a huge amount of work identifying lichens and you'll find out why as we go through. Um, so what lichens are, they are kind of like um, mycorrhizae that we talked about. They are a mutualism between something photosynthetic and a fungus. But in this case, a photosynthetic partner is tiny. It's tinier than the fungus. It is, um, it is between fungi and either uh, a true alga or cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria often called blue-green algae, even though they are in a completely different al uh, kingdom than algae are. They're in, they are actually a, a bacterium, a type of bacterium. Um, so lichen, uh, lichens are just an amazing mutualistic association uh, where um, we have these two organisms, um, the fungus and this algal or cyanobacterial partner that uh, form such a close relationship that they are given a single species and genus name. Um, now that is technically named after the fungus, but in order for a lichen to properly develop, it does need both partners. Lichens are an extremely important part of ecosystems. Um, they, in most ecosystems, they are just out there creating microhabitats, lots of little places for little critters to live. And those little critters are important parts for, of the food chain for bigger critters and so on. Um, another thing is when we have exposed rock, like after a landslide or when a new island is formed in the ocean, um, the lichens are the only organisms that can really effectively grow on rock and start to create soil by slowly breaking down the rock. Um, so vital in, in those situations. They also add um, nitrogen, especially the um, lichens that contain the cyanobacterial um, partners. The cyanobacteria are one of the few organisms that can pull nitrogen out of the air and make it into a usable form. And, uh, and so uh, when we have uh, some forest ecosystems, they, the majority of the nitrogen that's in the soil comes from these lichen associations. And uh, nitrogen is one of the three limiting nutrients to plant growth in most forests. Um, they also serve as important bioindicators. I actually just watched uh, or attended a webinar not too long ago about lichens as bioindicators. So um, especially when we're thinking about the effects of air pollution, uh, lichens are, uh, are not taking anything from what they're growing on. Instead, they are absorbing all of their nutrients, all of their water, all of everything that they're getting out of the dust and out of what's dissolved in rainwater. Um, so here we have uh, something that you can imagine when we have air pollution happening, 
it's going to be quite um, sensitive to that, especially particular species that are have, you know, more limited uh, sensitivities to certain types of uh, pollutants in the air. So a little bit about lichens. Again, we could do a whole talk about lichens, but. All right, so the next topic we're gonna have here is how are species protected? So how do we in Canada and in Alberta protect species? So certainly there are protected areas. We, we can protect species by protecting land. And that's, you know, that's definitely great. Um, but we're not gonna get into that side of the law. What we're gonna talk about here is how do we make sure that individual species don't go extinct um, and, and are protected that way. So federally, um, our Canadian government has passed the Species at Risk Act, call, and I'm going to use the acronym SARA for Species at Risk Act because um, that's what's commonly used. And what is protected by SARA? Well, it's certain very well studied species that we know are in serious, serious trouble. Um, but if you look at the Species at Risk Act, it doesn't really do that great a job protecting species. Um, it, it, and especially it doesn't do a great job protecting species habitats. So the only time habitat of species are really protected uh, with the Species at Risk Act is on federal lands. So that would be things like um, national parks and reserves and, you know, um, uh, air force bases and things like that. Um, but another way that the Species at Risk Act does allow for the protection of certain of these species is um, through the process of environmental assessments. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, as well as the federal government has the ability to create emergency orders to protect certain species that are in, at imminent risks, um, and then through partnerships. But of course, partnerships are gonna be sort of a voluntary thing that people uh, would enter, to, enter into. Um, there is a, sort of equivalent to the Species at Risk Act um, uh, uh, provincially in Alberta, and that's through um, the Wildlife Act and parts of the Wildlife Act. Um, and the main thing that is kind of governs how that happens is uh, through a strategy, the strategy for the management of species at risk. Um, so according to the Wildlife Act, all wildlife belongs to the province, but wildlife is fairly narrowly defined to mostly just animals and bigger animals for the most part. Um, but, you know, if you happen to find a frog in your yard and think it's going to make a good pet, you're not allowed to do that. All right. All wildlife belongs to the province. Um, but also within the Wildlife Act, there is our sections that allow for the protection of certain um, endangered organisms. And so that's where it broadens itself beyond wildlife to include plants and fungi and lichens and other things that might be considered to be um, endangered. Um, the definitions are kind of weird that are given there. It actually uses the term endangered organisms, um, but that's not the same terminology that is used in other stuff. So it's, it's kind of a weird way that it's been done, but it's generally enforced as anything that is um, been studied and put on the list of species at risk um, through the, um, the committee that's responsible for designating species at risk in Alberta. So from now on, when I'm going to be talking about these groups, whether it's federally or provincially, um, I'm going to call the species that are protected by one of these two acts um, at-risk uh, species. Um, you'll also hear them sometimes called listed species because they're on the list that are on one of these two acts. And sometimes um, you'll see them called sensitive species, although I think that's a really dumb term. You know, what, like it cries easily or what, you know, like why is it sensitive? And does it mean that it's more environmentally sensitive than something else? Probably not, we don't know. So I don't know, but you do see that term used in, um, in some of the databases and whatnot. All right, so these highly studied species are these at-risk or listed species. 
And so when you look at the species at risk designations, um, this is what's in the federal legislation, but there are um, slightly different categories in the, the provincial legislation. Uh, but basically you get the idea here that we can have species as being basically uh, no longer anywhere in the world extinct. It could be extirpated, which means it no, is no longer in that particular area, whether we're talking about Canada or Alberta, but it does survive somewhere else. Um, endangered is, here it is used as a specific definition that it's facing imminent um, extirpation or extinction. And there's some other categories like threatened or special concern that aren't quite as imminent, but we're still very concerned um, about what's going on with their populations. And just if you're thinking, well, I can't think of an, an extinct plant in Canada. Certainly there's a whole bunch of extinct animals we can think of perhaps of Canada, like the great auk or the Labrador duck. Um, but there is a species um, just in our neighboring province in BC that has been extirpated from BC. That's the organ lupine that we see in the corner there. So, we are now going to do a poll. So what you're going to do is you're going to see a poll pop up on your screen and I'll encourage everyone to participate. Um, so I'm going to put it there. So how many, this, everyone can take their best guess, how many fungi are there as listed species? So it could be a lichen or a macro fungus. How many do you think there are in Canada? So everyone give it your best guess here. So that's not just mac macro fungi, that's fungi total. I just yeah. To, yeah, yeah, that are listed species in Canada. So in on the on the species at risk act like we talked about. So I'll give you 10 more seconds to finish the poll. Nine, eight, seven, five, four, three, two, one. All right, we're gonna end the polling here. And we're gonna share the results. So looks like about 32 of you said there was 451. The majority of you thought 122. A few people thought 18 and 20% said zero. So you're gonna find out the answer. You have to wait. <laughs> I mean, it also helps keep you engaged. Teacher's trick here. <laughs> okay. So in addition to the limited protections that we have through those two acts, provincially and federally for these at-risk species, um, there can then be, there can also be site-specific protections. Um, and this is when we have some sort of a environmental permitting that is triggered by a particular project going forward. Um, so larger projects going forward in, in Canada will have to get uh, an impact assessment done, things that are in areas of federal jurisdiction, um, things that are in provincial jurisdiction that have to be kind of a certain size of project, have to get what's called an environmental impact assessment, very similar to an impact assessment, but um, um, but the idea here is that, that all of the impacts of this project have to be studied and mitigated for, mitigating mean that it's kind of made up for or making sure that it's fixed afterwards. Um, so it has to be taken care of um, to some degree. And then, you know, of course we know there will be perhaps some lasting impacts and then that has to be judged by whatever official is going to approve that project as to whether or not it is still in the provinces or in the country's best interest to have that project go forward. Um, there can also be other permits or approval processes that that are triggered by certain activities, by getting having to get certain types of permits or approvals for doing certain kinds of activities. And sometimes they, if particularly if it's in a known area where there are, you know, species at risk, then there might be some additional um, things put into the permit or the approval saying, oh, you got to make sure you do this to protect this habitat. Um, and even municipalities, many municipalities in Alberta are now requiring there to be uh, environmental assessment stunts for projects in their 
uh, area. For example, um, those of you who live in Edmonton, if you live beside the river valley, there is a bylaw that requires you to do an environmental assessment every time that you're going to be doing development within a certain distance of anything that feeds into the river valley. Um, and so part of that environmental assessment would include some sort of rare species surveys. And especially if we found um, some of the ones that we're talk, gonna talk about here, then you might have to do some, some mitigation. You might not be able to develop that particular area or you might have to do a transplanting project to try and, and protect uh, a rare plant species or something like that. Um, so these other processes, these impact assessments and permits and approvals, um, they allow regulators not only to protect the habitat of at-risk species, but they also allow for the protection of uh, a much bigger list of species that are considered rare species. So what are rare species, you're probably wondering, and how is that different than at-risk species? So what rare species are, is there species that are listed as tracked by uh, a province's conservation data center. And so um, every province has their own conservation data center. In Alberta, ours is called the Alberta Conservation Information Management System or ACMS for short. And so what ACMS has um, and the other conservation data centers have, is they have a list of species known from that prod province. Generally, they're all gonna have lists of plants. They have a plant list of the animals. Many of them have ecological communities, so like whole communities. Um, many of them have lichens and bryophytes, and some of them have macrofungi lists as well. A list of all the known species in that particular province. Um, and each is assigned a conservation rank. So how do they come up with these ranks? Um, we'll get into a little bit more detail on that in the next slide, but they look at that rank and perhaps some other information and then figure out should we track it or not? Is it the species that we're concerned about potentially um, conservation-wise in the pro province? And so uh, now if these species are now tracked, they don't have any official protections. There's nothing under the Wildlife Act. There's nothing under any particular law that says you have to do this if you have a rare species or a tracked species on your project or on your property. But when they're a part of the environmental assessments that are being done, that's where the the people that are doing the surveys can say, hey, we found this rare species. Um, so we think that you should put your road here instead of here so that you're not gonna disrupt the habitat of this species. Or you might do a trans be required to do a transplanting project because they're considered um, uh, you know, things that are an ecologically important element that, is, that they, you wanna make sure isn't damaged as part of your environmental assessment. So they don't have any official legal protection until it's made as part of um, some sort of an other ass uh, environmental assessment, like these site-specific things that we were just talking about. Um, so uh, this Alberta Conservation Information Management System and the other conservation data centers, they assign these ranks using uh, a system that was designed by a um, uh, uh, conservation group called Nature Serve or organization. Um, and it will include a letter at the beginning and then maybe another letter or a number. So the first part of that code, so you can see there's uh, three examples given there, S, X, G2, and N5. So um, the first part of the code then has to do what level we're talking about. So S stands for state, because um, this was developed in um, the United States. It would be the same as a provincial rank in Canada. So S would mean, um, if we're talking about a Canadian species. Um, oh, I just saw a whole bunch more people in, this, in the waiting room. Sorry here. Sorry those that, uh, that are just joining us that are late. I, I didn't see you guys join the waiting room here. Um, yeah, so we're talking about how rare species are ranked. 
Um, and so, yeah, so they can be ranked globally, nationally, or provincially, and preferably we have ranks on all levels for the species. Um, and an example here of a rare species um, is uh, the Blackfoot River Evening Primrose. This is a plant that is not listed in Alberta on, on the Species at Risk Act federally or the Wildlife Act um, under those regulations provincially, but it is a rare species and it's actually considered critically imperiled in Alberta, meaning that it's really, really uh, probably close to getting wiped out. So then what's the next part of the code? Well, it's gonna be either a letter or a number. Most of them are gonna be given a number, like the five numbers in the middle, with one being the most endangered kind of thing, um, being critically imperiled in the province or federally or globally, all the way to five being secure, that we are quite confident that its populations are doing well. Um, you can see at the top there, there are two codes for potentially extirpated species, presumed meaning that we, um, we have a pretty good idea. We've done a lot of studies on it and we're pretty sure it's not present anymore and possibly being, we haven't seen it in a long time, probably not there, but nobody's studied it very much. You can also see some other things like you being an unrankable species and are being unranked and that's normally um, what happens when we just don't have enough information and sometimes NA and that would be when uh, we're, we know that you know there's a, a species that's an introduced species from another part of the world and so we don't really want to say it's you know a conservation importance um, so we just put not applicable who cares and there are a few fungi macrofungi that are introduced species and that you don't see in the wild in Alberta but we do have records of them and so what's then considered a rare plant or a tract element well, it'll be anything that's either been extirpated or generally speaking, anything that's got a rank of a one or a two. So critically imperiled to imperiled. Um, sometimes you will see vulnerable species being um, put on the list. Um, uh, not very common and usually because uh, it was formerly listed as a tract element uh, or as a rare species, but then um, there's been more information that we're probably sure that is vulnerable, but we're just gonna be careful and still keep an eye on it. So this is really important for what we're gonna be talking about in a minute. So kind of get this in your head. All right, so basically ones and twos if are our highest level of cons um, concern. And of course, anything that's been extirpated. And, uh, and yeah, so keep that in, in mind as we go through. So how do we determine rankings? And again, I've been, I've done this, um, this process for thousands of species in Alberta. So I could tell you lots and lots about this if you really wanted to know. Um, but there's 10 factors that are generally used uh, or that can be used in the, there's a calculator that you use. You plug your numbers in and you see what it pops out. Um, and so the things that are used to figure out what's rare, what's not, of course, it's rarity, depending on how your population size is, how big the range is across Canada or across Alberta, how specific it is to its environment, and then a few other factors. Another thing you can use is if you have the information, you can use trends. So is the population going up or is it going down, um, both long-term and short-term? Um, and, and or is the area that it's in kind of decreasing? And then lastly, you can consider threats, things that are gonna be potentially causing populations to go down. Um, are there, is there more forestry development that's happening in its primary habitat or oil sands development or you know, other kinds of uh, pressures? Does it live close to areas that are becoming urbanized rapidly or things like that? 
Now, when, we're, when I was doing the work with macro fungi, we basically have very, very little information. So almost all of it is based on the population size and the range extent, because that's, you know, that's basically what we have for records. We're being able to tell trends or threats is uh, kind of beyond our ability to know because we just don't have that kind of data. So here's our second two polls that we're going to do. All right, so the first one is now we're last time we did all the fungi together. So we're going to do um, here the next poll. Oh, um, sorry, I am doing the wrong thing here. So I should change the poll here. There we go. All right, so the first one is how many rare lichen species do you think there are in Alberta? So we're splitting up the fungi now to lichens and macro fungi. So how many rare lichens do you think there are? Give it a try. There will be massive kudos to anybody who gets all of our polls correct. So keep track of what you put down as your answer. Okay, I'm going to close it in 10 seconds. In eight, five, four, three, two, one. All right, we're going to end the polling and see what most people thought. So looks like. Uh, the there was a exactly 50-50 tie between 249 and 52. Only one person thought 558, one person thought zero, and then another two-way tie between the 121 and the eight. That's interesting. All right, so we're gonna now go to the next poll here, which is what about macrofungi? How many rare macrofungi do you think there are in Alberta? So go ahead and put your answer in here. So macrofungi on that Akims list as being a tracked element in the province. And we'll close in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so what do we have for responses? So most of you guys thought 67 is a, the winner and looks like we've got a pretty even amount ex in the rest of them except only one person thought 781. All right, so keep your, your answers in the back of your head and we'll see if you're right or not. Oh, I didn't share the results. Here's the results if you didn't get to see them. All right, so let's close this up. All right, so now I'm gonna talk to you about one of the biggest problems with fungal conservation, and that is mycophobia, ha, 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 ha. Um, so there is this fear of fungi in the general public. For those of you who pick mushrooms uh, to eat, you know, when you talk to your friends, a lot of times they're going to look at you like you have just told them that you go out and lick rocks for a living. Like, what the heck? You are insane. Why would you do that? All right. So there is this fear that is out there in, in the broad community. Um, and so that has led to, in the general public, and politicians are, are no ex uh, exception, that they're just generally then fungi are being undervalued. There's these exaggerated fears of species that are poisonous. Oh, there's so many poisonous fungi out there. In fact, you know what? If you wanna talk about poisonous things, let's talk about poisonous plants. There's way more poisonous plants than there are poisonous fungi as a percentage of the, 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 the species that are out there and they have way worse toxins than most fungi do. The number of fungi that can kill you, you know, you could probably list them on a, you know, on a couple of hands, but the number of toxic plants that are out there that could kill you are 
huge number. And then, of course, people think about the hallucinogenic species. Anybody that you talk to that you say, oh, I'm into mushrooms, you know what they look at. They, they look to you and say, oh, yeah, can you get me some of those cool mushrooms, right? All right, so there's these exaggerated fears of the poisonous ones, people thinking, focusing on just as few hallucinogenic species and like that's what all fungi are about. And of course people, um, some people have had fungal infections and so then they're thinking, oh, fungi, they're out there killing my plants or giving me athlete's foot or yeast infections. I don't like fungi. Right, so there's these negative connotations um, and negative uh, stereotypes, shall we say, um, that fungi have. And of course, they don't have the cute and fuzzy factor. You know, they don't, you, you can't show a, a mushroom and somebody says, oh, it's so cute, I just want to cuddle it. Right, you don't get that. You know, the closest thing I could think of is a shaggy mane. You can see the picture in the bottom corner. Here's a nice fuzz, at least it's fuzzy, but it's definitely all cute and it turns into inky goo. Oh no, it's no longer, you know, no longer very cuddly. So yeah, they're, there's, they're just don't tend to be as like, uh, able to capture the public's attention. Another thing that we kind of touched on before is the ecosystem processes that they perform. Most people have no idea like a, what a mycorrhiza is. Um, they might think that you're talking about some strange band from Sweden or something. Um, but you know, these important ecological relationships people don't have an idea about and decomposition. Generally, when you learn about ecology in your grade whatever classes, what do you learn about? You learn about the food chain. The predators eat the herbivores and the herbivores eat the plants. Nobody talks about decomposition and yet it's such an important um, ecological process and it's generally not seen as important as important as things like predation or herbivory. Um, why is that? Again, it's kind of a combination of these factors. Um, and so all these things have led to there have been a much, much lower emphasis placed on research and conservation of fungi versus our cute fuzzy things and our grizzly bears and our uh, caribou and our, you know, even flowers. You know, those are get a lot more attention in the general public. And as far as federal and provincial dollars go and research dollars. So where are we then? Let's take a quick look at where we are around the world. So let's first look at how many species there are on our planet of these different major groups. So in this chart here, we can see that there's a lot of invertebrates, well over 800 or 8 million, pardon me, invertebrates. Um, you can see we've got plants um, reaching about 700,000-ish. We got vertebrates. Um, so the, the gray line here is how many species we estimate there are. The red or orange line is how many we've actually described. So there's a lot of invertebrates we haven't described. Notice how plants, we've got a lot of our plants. Vertebrates, we've got a fair proportion of the vertebrates described. And fungi, you notice here the number is about 1.6 million, but that is probably a vast underestimation. And um, recent work has shown that there may even be as many, fung many fungi as there are invertebrates. So we're talking about close to the 8 million mark of, of fungi out there. as we start to do this genetic work and find out how many fungi don't grow in culture and how many um, we things that we thought were two species or was one species is actually five or 10 species once we look at it genetically. Um, so, so yeah, so there's a lot of fungi out there. We haven't described very many of them. And uh, there even you see the priorities. Um, so let's look at the next thing is how many are on the red list. So the red lists are kind of the highly studied species that are uh, highly protected in, um, and this is looking internationally. So look at how many vertebrates there are, nearly 50,000 vertebrates uh, listed on red listed species compared to the tiny little line that you see in the first graph of how many we've actually described and, and how many we know. Invertebrates, we've got a few plants, doing not too bad. 
And of course, I have to write in the numbers for the lichens and the macrofungi, because otherwise you can't really see their lines. All right, so we've got 22 li lichens and 123 uh, fun macrofungi that have been protected um, internationally um, that are actually made it to these more official red lists like the Species at Risk Act in Canada. So that's all changing, right? People are studying it and they're learning more and there's dollars being put into it. Well, let's see where dollars and research is being gone into. So this is, um, this is what has ha was happened between uh, the year 2018 and 2019 of how many we were being assessed. So about 70,000 animals were assessed about 25,000 and a half plants were assessed, 15 species of algae and 56 species of fungi. So this bad situation is really not getting a heck of a lot better. Um, there's just not a lot of research being done trying to determine are these fungi really at risk? Are they gonna become, be becoming extinct or not? So which countries do have lists, uh, red lists of, um, of, of macro fungi. So this uh, map shows which species or which countries have lists of macro fungi that they're working on. So you can see Canada is on there. The USA, it's, it's not on the official map, but it does include a little bit of, of, of fungi in their lists. Um, the, the dark red means that their less lists are being kept relatively up to date and the, the light colors means that somebody put some work into it a while back but nobody's really working on it um, very much recently and things have gone out of date. So not the majority of countries but at least some work being done and you see a lot more work being done in Europe than in many of the other countries around the world. So how many fungi make it on the red lists of some of these countries? So now we're talking about country level listings. So um, you can see hugely variable depending on which country we talk, we're talking about. Switzerland with uh, 937 macrofungi on their lists, um, all the way down to Armenia with 31. And you can see some of them doing uh, quite well at assessing a lot of different species and, and some doing not so well. All right, so now where are we in North America? How are we doing? So in the US, here's the lists of species that are um, on these lists, these listed or at-risk species. Um, so the US, you know, has got about a little over 400 vertebrates. It's got uh, about 950 plants. We got two lichens, two lichens, and that's it for fungi in the United States. Are we doing any better in Canada? Well, marginally, we've got just over 300 vertebrates. For plants, we've got just over 200. We've got 19 lichens, woo, and zero macrofungi. So those of you guys who put down zero for that first one of how many species the first poll, you are correct. So give yourself a hand, all right, if you got that correct. So zero Canadian species at risk that are macrofungi, but uh, there are 19 lichens included. All right, so this is uh, what happened the last time that there was the major, uh, so federally there's a major um, assessment done every five years for the last while. They call this the general status of wild species in Canada, or species in Canada um, that is done. And so this was what was done in the previous five year period. We're still waiting for the 2020 document to come out. So in 2015, what was assessed? So this is just macrofungi on this graphic. And what I want you to pay close attention to is gray. All right, so gray means we did an assessment and we couldn't come up with a rank. All right, so look how much gray is on here. Like 
probably 90% of the species that were ranked, they just said, nah, I couldn't come up with a rank. We don't have enough information. Um, things that weren't considered to be unrankable or unranked, um, a lot of the rest of them were ones that we just know are super common, all right, that we know that they're either secure or apparently secure. Um, how many do we think are critically imperiled in Canada? Well, apparently there's none except for in Newfoundland. That's all we know is Newfoundland's got a few. And um, imperiled, how many are imperiled? So this is a kind of the S2 rank, or I mean, this would be N2, pardon me, because we're talking federally. Um, then we've got a few in Labrador. Apparently Newfoundland's got um, only the, the only really truly rare fungi in Canada. Um, according to these assessments. And then a few vulnerable ones also in Newfoundland and, and in Ontario, the yellow bars there. But again, you know, the, this information really isn't all that helpful for fungal conservation unless you've got the, the red bar or the uh, orange bar. But the rest of it is kind of like meh, the common or we don't know. Um, so how are things going in Alberta? Um, so I know this chart is a little bit confused or this graphic is a little bit confusing. Uh, so I'm gonna just point at the chart that's kind of in the corner here. Um, so um, the first the column there is how many species were evaluated. So this is basically how many species are, are, are being looked at. Um, and, and generally speaking, it's, it's gonna try and be all of the species in the province. Um, are going to be looked at. So um, currently on the list of fungi in Alberta that ACIMS current, currently has, our conservation data center, it has 463 macrofungi listed. Um, and you can see the biggest number of organisms that have been assessed are invertebrates with 400, 4,800-ish. We have 3,100 plants that have been assessed. Uh, about 850 lichens and about 485, well, 485 vertebrate species. So now, now look at the proportion here of the evaluated to the tract. Okay, so of the vertebrates that have been looked at, we have say approximately 500, we've got only about 150, or we, we have about 150 out of those 485 that have said, yeah, we got to track them. Um, invertebrates, fairly high proportion. Plants, so look at it's nearly a third of them that are being tracked. Nearly a third of plants in Alberta are considered a tracked element or considered a rare plant in Alberta. Um, lichens, look at that, it's over half. Over half of the lichens that we know of in Alberta are considered rare or at risk or, or um, are tracked elements in Alberta. And then macrofungi. What the heck's going on here? Only nine out of the 463 species have, have been designated as tracked. So it's just this tiny proportion that have figured that we figure we have, at least the last assessment figures that they had enough information on them to assign them a rank. And then how many of those make it actually being on our at-risk things that are protected by the Wildlife Act in Alberta. Uh, we have 58 vertebrates, four only invertebrates out of those 672 that were tracked, 10 plants only, and of course fungi getting the shortest end of the non-existent stick. Um, no lichens and no macrofungi are currently on the at-risk lists in Alberta. Since, Michael, since there are only nine macrofungi tracked, could you name those, please, or could you... No, I'm sorry, I, I don't have those available. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, I'd just like to compare that. Anyway, okay, thank you. But I can look it up for you and, and, and let you know. That would be great. Or send but me a link quite frankly, I'm not sure I'm very confident in those ranks. Um, <laughs> 
I, that doesn't surprise me in the least. Yeah, and a lot of those species names have changed since yeah. that the last updating of their list. So, in fact, like I would say about at least a third of the species um, aren't really present in Alberta anymore, according to the latest studies, or else the name has changed or, or something like that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So now we're going to talk about the project that I did um, a couple of years ago. Um, so I was part of a team that were, were to assigned to work on um, the 2020 wild species uh, report. And um, I was given the three prairie provinces to kind of figure out the ranks of the macro fungi in the three prairie provinces. Other people were, there was a group that worked on them in BC. Um, there's a fellow that worked on them in the territories. Um, there were people that were working on them in uh, Atlantic provinces and in Quebec and Ontario. Uh, so this was to en encompass all provinces and then the data that we uh, put together was will then be used to put together a federal rank for these species, kind of like that chart that we looked at not too long ago. So, um, how many records did I get of fungi? Um, well, I, I am passionate about this, so I kind of went a little bit beyond the call of duty, and I, because none of the data from our herbaria have been digitized. So, there's no actual data for all the fungi that have been accessioned in our major herbaria, which is where most of the information really is, is in herbaria. So, I took it upon myself to go to the um, uh, the two major herbaria in Alberta and actually go and list out all the species. There may be people here, I think maybe Barb was one of the people that helped me work in one of the herbaria um, and so uh, that was in the U of A herbaria, herbarium. Um, so yeah, so myself and some volunteers, we worked together uh, very, very hard to take all of these fungal fungal specimens and put them into a digital database that we can then use to actually do this kind of project. So um, altogether, I had about 35,000 records of fungi in the Prairie Provinces. Um, after doing cleaning of things that were not usable because of name changes or only had it to species or um, whatever problems that there were with the data ended up being about 30,000 records. So how many species did we come up with in Alberta and the other prairie provinces? So we ended up with 1,920 species of fungi that have been recorded from Alberta, uh, 747 from Saskatchewan, and 1,452 species from Manitoba. Now, I'm not going to get too far into um, the other two prairie provinces because our, our talk here is more focused on Alberta, but at least you get an idea of what's going on. So, now you guys remember how many rare species were there before? Do you guys, anybody remember? I'll give you a clue. You could fit it on less than two hands. How many tracked species were there? Yeah. Nine. Nine is correct. All right. So now I'm going to ask a poll. How many species do you think that when I did the project that I got ranks of either S1 or variances on S1 or S2? So what would generally be considered rare species or potentially rare species? So I'm going to launch our next poll here. Here we go. So you guys can now put your answer in. How many do you think were given those S1 to S2 or some sort of um, un close to that with a level of uncertainty? All right. Come on, everybody, let's get your votes in. You got 25 people with their votes in. 
Can you give you 10 more seconds? All right, five, four, three, two, one, and we're gonna end it. All right, so let's see what you guys thought. All right, so it looks like the majority of you thought I didn't find any rare species. I'm sorry to say you were not correct. All right, I did find more than nine. So I guess now you know the nine people are not correct. So how many species did I end up ranking as being S1 or S2? Well, why don't we look here? So I'm going to stop sharing that. All right, so. Now we're looking at the first two rows. Okay, so this is what I came up with is 276 or 275 plus 266. So those of that those of you who picked the 500 and some number, all right, that's how many um, were that I assessed that I could figure that we probably are should be paying attention to these species conservation wise. In Manitoba, still had a fair amount of species that um, that we that I ranked, but not nearly as many. Just because the data, a lot of the data from Manitoba was really, really, really old, and so um, difficult to to say how how um, reliable uh, a lot of that is current day. And Saskatchewan only ended up with 15 species, getting the higher ranks. Um, the, the more at risk ranks simply because lack of information and you know you only have one or two records of a particular species and and very little survey work that's been done um, so you can see um, not very many species got the s and a rank because those would be introduced species not that many introduced species but there were seven in alberta um, and you see the vast majority of all of them were in the SU, all right, meaning that it was unrankable. We just don't have enough information to have any degree of certainty in assigning a rank. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering what the question marks means, it means that there is, you're thinking it's somewhere around there, but you're not absolutely sure and when you see S1, S2, or S2, S3, it means it's somewhere in between those two. You're not sure exactly where, which one it might be, you know, the one on the lower end, it might be one on the higher end, but um, you have a pretty good idea that it's somewhere in between those numbers. So what's next? And we've got now these ranks present. Um, so those conserva conservation ranks have been reviewed by people at Environment and Climate Change Canada, and they have sent that data off to the provincial conservation data sensors. Um, so then the provinces are then responsible for taking those ranks and incorporating them and updating their, um, their lists with those those ranks if they're happy with the work um, that was done. And the big thing though uh, is, so what? Okay, we have a list, so what? So currently, um, macrofungi have not been surveyed for as part of rare species surveys. Even though there were those nine species, nobody's ever looked for them as part of a rare species survey. Why? Because it's hard and we're going to talk about that. Um, so how are we ever going to get macrofungi protected in these, in the, in our, in our province? Um, well, it's going to be really up to regulators, up to biologists and up to the public to put pressure on politicians to get fungi um, included as part of rare species surveying and have them incorporated into conservation plans and have them being studied so that we can get more reliable information on whether or not they are really rare or whether or not they are, um, you know, just under, under studied, under, under surveyed. If, if this doesn't happen, 
Um, you can think of how many species that we have in Alberta that we know of and how many, you remember looking at that, that graphic showing how many undescribed species there are, many undescribed species that we uh, could very well be losing um, as we um, do projects and developments across Alberta. So there is a really high risk that we could start to see species become extirpated, perhaps even extinct. Maybe there's fungi that, that are found only in the Rocky Mountains or only in the Cypress Hills. Right now, we don't really know. Um, and so we could have even the extinctions being happening around here in Alberta and, and not even know it. And it, e even if you're not concerned about extinctions or extirpation, um, you know, what about all that loss of biodiversity that we might be seeing as we, um, if we, as we do these projects without any consideration of um, these so vital parts of our ecosystems? So I'm going to see if I've convinced you. Our last poll for the day. So I want to see if you guys think, and be honest, okay, do you think we should be surveying for macro fungi in Alberta? So I'll launch that poll right now. All right, so your options are yes, no, maybe, um, uh, or but can I eat them? And that means you're in the wrong seminar, my friend. <laughs> Be honest, if you're not sure, just say maybe. All right, oh, hey, we got 33 responses in already. That's that's a record, Only we only had 30 on the first few. All right, we're gonna close in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so it looks like 91% of you guys so I'm gonna present this to the provincial government as an official survey of the uh, Alberta population. <laughs> I wish. All right. And, oh, I didn't share the results. So there's the results for you guys to see. Yeah, 91% of you guys said yes. Okay. So if we're to move forward, what needs to happen? Um, what are the challenges that, that are making it so hard to get these conserved? Well, the first is difficulty of identification. Um, they are very hard to identify. Often you need fresh specimens, you need microscopic features, uh, you need a high level of expertise to be able to get it to species accurately. Um, and the, the simple fact is even what we think we know, you know, may not be the case. Um, so there's so many cryptic species, species that don't really look significantly different from one another. So you, unlike, you know, um, plants or animals, there's no need for fungi to try and look different from each other. It's not like they're using each other and mating with each other based on how they look, right? And that's what it caused most species to look different from each other is they, they want to look different so they can tell this is a member of my species and you're a member of another species. So I'm going to treat you differently. No, no reason for fungi to do that because they're mating underground. Those of you who attended um, my, I did a fungal sex seminar a while back. Um, and so, yeah, you'll know that the mating goes on underground. So they're using chemical signals. So there's no reason for them to, to look different, even if they have become a distinct species and evolved into separate species. Um, there's a lot of work that's shown that species in North America that we assumed were the same as the species in Asia or Europe are different species. Um, so there's all that. And then there's others that, that are difficult to identify because they only differ by habitat or really tiny features that you wouldn't even think to look for. Um, or some, there are some species out there that we can't even tell apart by looking at them, even though we know they're two species. It's only through genetic testing that we actually can say, ah, there's two species here, but there's no habitat difference that we can use and there's no distinguishing features when you're looking at the fruiting bodies. And so that makes a lot of the identifications out there really suspect. When you use an identification guide, you're basing your, your names that you're giving them on this guide, even though 
now we know that's not necessarily the correct name. And also historical records. One of my big challenges, my big decisions I had to make when I was doing this was um, Armillaria malia. It's a honey mushroom. How many of you guys are familiar with a honey mushroom? Put up your hand if you're familiar with a honey mushroom. Yeah, a lot of people are familiar with honey mushrooms. Um, but all the fungi that were in, in the herbaria were listed as Armillaria malia as a, the honey mushroom. But now we know that there's actually a couple of species of Armillaria, and Armillaria are in, that could be in Alberta, and Armillaria malia isn't one of them. So now I have these hundreds of records of Armillaria malia that I don't know what to do with, right? Do I assign them to the species that is the more common one and just assume that it's the one that we figure is the more common one? Or do I just throw all that data out? Right, so there's, there's these real difficulties in using um, the ID guides that are out there and that's, you know, that's generally what you got to use for identification. Um, and yeah, difficulty in using those historical records. However, there is hope. There is a, a light at the end of the tunnel for this and that is using the world of DNA. Um, and so um, I think if we're going to have this accomplished, uh, we need to expand our use of the DNA collection and sequencing to get firm IDs on these mushrooms. And that way, even if names change, we've got the genetic sequence, and then we can now assign it to which of the two species or three species it's been split into. Um, and so that I think is gonna be sort of the answer. Um, just as an example for even well-known species of what's um, going on with species names. Um, so everybody is probably familiar in this room with black morels and yellow morels, or at least morels in general. Um, so if you look at the ID guides, everything is going to be um, in, the, in you know, the, the popular ID guides that are out there, uh, either Morchella esculenta or Morchella elata in Alberta. Now that's what our ID guides say. Um, when you look at North America, how many guys find Morchella esculenta or Morchella elata? Or Morchella is being, um, of course, put into just the M. Uh, can you find it in North America? If you can, you've got some crazy things going on in your eyes because Morchella esculenta actually isn't in North America. And neither is Morchella elata. Instead, um, everything that we've been calling Morchella um, elata, which is a black morel, any, everything that's got black text on there is a black morel. So in North America, um, we've got um, two, four, six, seven species that are only in the west of black morels, four species that are found in the east, and then if you look um, down below in the tron transcontinental, you see that there are uh, five different species that are found um, in both uh, in North America and Europe. So all of those are black morels. And the ones that have male something, those are ones that we can't distinguish them. Um, there's no proper even description for these species yet. And all the yellow ones are what we used to call Morchella, escul um, Mor Morchella esculenta. The red ones are what we call the blushing morels. And there's one of them that is in North America, uh, the one that is that tron transcontinental Rufo, Rufo brunea. So it just kind of highlights the difficulties in trying to assign conservation ranks based on our historical data where we have only Esculenta and Elata, um, and, um, and our AD guides still aren't really able to distinguish all these species very well. Okay, so another challenge that we have is just the challenge of surveying them. Um, so fungi are present year round. They are in the soil, they're in the wood and whatever, but um, they're not easy to see. There are these just gonna be as, as little microscopic filaments. So the only time that they're really gonna be recognizable for proper surveying, unless you're just gonna go out there and 
grab random soil and wood sandals or samples and send them off to see what's there in the lab. Um, you really want to get those fruiting bodies and so those are often produced only seasonally. They have to have sufficient moisture or other certain environmental conditions in order to be produced. Uh, a lot of times they can be short-lived and some of them will only last for a day or two. Um, and, um, and they may not even be produced every year. Sometimes um, those of you who have gone mushroom hunting know that sometimes you'll go to a spot and it'll be there for two years in a row. You go there the next year, it's not present. You go there the year after and it's back again. Um, and so um, that makes surveying for them awfully difficult. And so generally speaking, the best surveying um, would be done over several visits throughout the year to kind of capture that seasonality after a rainfall um, because then we, we have uh, hopefully sufficient moisture. Um, so, so that's a challenge in trying to get proper surveying for macro fungi. However, again, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Rare plant surveys, when I was doing them, were generally done twice a year, once in the beginning of the season and once towards the end. But nowadays, recommendations and many companies have moved to three times a year rare plant survey. So that means if we can get the botanists that are out there doing rare plant surveys to do some rare fungi surveys, at least we're getting a decent amount of information. At least we're getting some going on with, um, with uh, fungal surveying. So it's, again, it's not beyond the scope of what's doable um, to get at least some macro fungi surveyed as part of these rare plant surveys. Of course, another and probably the biggest hurdle that needs to be jumped over is a lack of precedent. People haven't done it before and now you're going to tell your client that yeah, they have to pay another extra couple thousand dollars for you, someone to do macro fungi surveys as part of their environmental assessment. All right, clients aren't going to say, oh yeah, make sure you include that for me because you know I like fungi, right? They aren't going to do that. So it's going to be um, it's going to be a challenge, especially for the first few, to get start setting that precedent of starting to include macro fungi. Um, so both regulators and biologists um, can push this forward. Um, people that are are in government can say, "Hey, how come you didn't survey for those those rare macro fungi as part of your survey work?" I'm not going to accept this EIA. Uh, until you start including those macro fungi or the biologists can can maybe start offering it as a less expensive option than perhaps it's going to be worth and 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 use that to start to to push its way um, and get them accepted as part of it and it, and adding new groups is not unprecedented um, when uh, 20 years ago when rare plant surveys were done only vascular plants were looked at now um, Nowadays, it's the standard that you're not only going to look for vascular plants, but you're also looking for lichens and you're also looking for mosses and bryophytes. So adding new groups and, and even big groups, because there's lots of mosses and bryophytes out there, um, adding those, you know, it has happened. So it's not beyond the scope of what's reasonable to say, hey, we now know more about macro fungi. We need to start surveying for them as well. So in order to make this happen, um, there needs to be protocols developed for proper surveying. Um, so when you're looking at rare plant surveys, uh, who has developed the protocols? It's not the government. It's actually a non, not-for-profit group called the Alberta Native Plant Council. And they are the people that have developed guidelines for rare vascular plant surveys. And when I was doing and still do rare vascular plant surveys, um, that's the standards that I use because that's industry standard. Um, there is no official standards for doing mosses and lichens, um, but there's the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute that has developed protocols that they use for surveying for lichens and for mosses. And so a lot of people are, gonna, are using those protocols. When I was working in consulting, I, um, ABMI wasn't around yet. And so I developed protocols for our company to, to use for properly surveying um, uh, lichens or bryophytes. 
and uh, those Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, can we rely on them to come up with something? Um, well, the fact is that they actually only included uh, macro fungi for a very short time and, and even then they only included wood decay polypores as part of their sampling of biodiversity. So even they haven't even sort of even dipped their toe very much into the world of macro fungi uh, yet. So we can't depend on the ABMI, the Alberta Native Plant Council, you know, they are very focused on vascular plants. So we're probably not going to see them developing anything anytime soon. So I think probably the best way is for the Alberta Mycological Society to get involved. And we have had a lot of experience doing macrofungus surveys, um, especially uh, the more uh, official one that we do every year, uh, except for this year, unfortunately, um, through the Alberta Foray. So the protocols that we use there, um, I think could be easily um, translated and, and, and taught for uh, people that are not fungal specialists, but are rare plant specialists and are out there doing rare plant surveys. Let's get them using similar protocols to what we use for the Alberta forays for uh, collecting and processing and collecting um, DNA and preserving macrofungus specimens as part of the work that they do. So I think that that could easily be done. And so here's an uh, um, example of one of our uh, Alberta forays that we have. So you can see the first photo here, we've got people working on um, putting all these fungi into major groups and, um, and getting them separated into their different species. Um, here we see some photography going on to get some really good photos of the mushrooms while they're still fresh. Um, you can see me here as I spend most late evenings and early mornings identifying mushrooms with my microscope and trying to get decent IDs on these things. You can see here our DNA stations in the bottom corner with the hammer where we're collecting um, DNA specimens from our um, from our macrofungi and then in the other bottom corner here we see the the drying process to get um, specimens that can be preserved for long-term storage. So that's the collection protocols. So again a doable thing. The next thing after collection protocols is, is getting people able to dis, at least be able to distinguish this is a different species than that species. They don't need to know how to identify every mushroom in the, in the field. They just need to know to dis, how to distinguish, oh look, we've got this species and it's different than that species. And I can tell that by looking at these particular characteristics. Um, so unfortunately, there's not mycology offered um, by very many post-secondary institutes in Alberta, um, even as an optional course, much less a required part of your training. Um, and even where you do cover them, um, there's not really a lot of field mycology that's done as part of these courses, unfortunately. I took two mycology courses as part of my master's work. And the first one was sort of an intro mycology course that was open to undergrads. And the other one was a, um, a grad level course for, um, for those of us that were in the lab doing our masters and PhDs. Um, and even in that, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if we actually went and collected one fungus from the field and identified it. We did a project where we looked at fungi growing on dung that our teacher had collected. And we did projects, you know, looking at preserved specimens and stuff like that, but not a lot of field mycology even in the courses that were offered. Um, however, I believe that using these with these um, DNA techniques and, and you know, at least a, a bit of training, we can get most botanists in there to gain the required skills that they would need to at least be able to differentiate and get an idea of, you know, how many different species that they have and then they can get a genetics sample from each. Um, and of course, as they learn more, they'll, they'll be able to develop those skills more and more through field practice. Um, most botanists are people that are very detail oriented. You know, that's why you do botany. You don't do botany if you're a kind of person that's just, you know, 
you're you're ready to throw a name on something uh, in in uh, 30 seconds or less, you you become a botanist because you're you're a detail oriented person. So those kind of people are great for mycology too. Um, an example of of where that shows this is doable. There is the North American Mycoflora project, um, and it's using primarily um, DNA samples and specimens collected by amateurs, people that haven't really had any official training. Um, and they're using that to document biodiversity of North America. So why can't we expand something like that um, to include Alberta and start to get um, similar work being done with our environmental professionals? And of course, those we have to have experts that can then verify and start to collect those um, or take those dried mushrooms and and DNA samples and be able to do something with them. So um, there there are uh, always the the need for for experts. Um, the thing is, there are mycologists like myself out there. When I was doing my grad work, um, there were I think five other people in my lab. Um, so you can think of how many people have graduated with PhDs or, or, um, or master's degrees in mycology over the years. Um, but the thing is, most of them aren't working in the area of mycology because there's not a lot of work there. So we have the people, we have people, we have experts with training. Um, a lot of them will be rusty, but they have the, the letters behind their name and the ability to do it. It's just there's no no work for them right now. So why not, why not get some of these people back into their passions and into areas where they can make some money off of their, um, their learning and get involved in, um, in doing these identifications. Um, and of course, the people doing the genetic work, uh, there are labs out there doing that genetic work. Um, but of course, if we're gonna expand that to being a requirement for professional surveys, that expert or that is gonna have to be expanded. Um, but you know, it, it's a classic case of if you build it, they will come, right? As soon as you start to have something that's a requirement, people will expand their capabilities to be able to do that and hire more people. Um, I think uh, the Alberta Mycological, pardon me, the Alberta Mycological Society, as well as the North American Mycological Association has many, many experts um, um, that are willing to help and able to do um, work and have uh, levels of expertise, perhaps in particular species groups. Um, so again, we put, start putting out the demand, these people will, will be able to rise to the occasion. So let's kind of wrap this up here. Um, the, the, the fact is that hopefully very soon we're going to have rare macro fungi and good lists of rare, rare macro fungi that are be, that'll be included in both federal and provincial lists. Um, these are important species in the ecosystems playing vital roles as mycorrhizae and as decomposers and other roles as well. Um, if we're gonna have these species protected, biologists and regulators and the public in general needs to push to get these included in rare species surveys and get conservation plans set in place as part of um, uh, these, uh, the environmental assessment processes that are happening all around us in Alberta. If we wanna prevent them from being either extirpated or seeing significant losses of biodiversity um, there are challenges, definitely, but um, I, I think I've, perhaps, I've hopefully made the argument that they can be reasonably overcome. I believe Alberta Mycological Society can play a significant um, role here in helping to develop protocols. And I believe the next steps here are going to be to get biologists and regulators on board, um, to get the needed training and to push for starting to get these um, uh, included and to get these networks developed of the contacts and the expertise to to get these uh, things in motion. Michael, this is Deanne and I have to say thank you so much. Um, you've opened my eyes. I do work for a major oil and gas company and I live in an acreage 
in Alberta. Yeah. And was fascinated with mushrooms and the Alberta Mycological Society shared your post. And I'm so glad that I tuned in. I've been part of installing pipelines and you've just elevated the importance of this and it's not been recognized in my experience and I will take your message forward. You're going to make me cry here. <laughs> well, well, you've given me goosebumps. I'm so glad <laughs> I tuned in and thank you. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, as uh, any other questions that you guys have, I'm going to just scroll through some um, rare Alberta macro fungi as we we finish out here. So I, in each of these slides, I include some distinctive features of these and how many times they've been recorded from Alberta and who we have records from doing the collections and or the identifications. I've got a question for you, Michael. With sure. Regard to, because I used to sit on the environmental assessment uh, panels. Well, not the panels. I, I was part of the environmental assessments. And when I got up and said, as part of your vegetation analysis, yeah. you must be including fungi. Because if you don't realize that you have to include fungi in your, ve in your revegetation, you're not going to get the required biodiversity and your revegetation process is mm -hmm. going to be flawed. And they all look at me and think, oh my God, get that crazy person out of here. <laughs> so how do you present such that you're, you're, <laughs> you're taken a little bit more seriously? I would appreciate some advice on that because it's, it's extremely frustrating. Oh yeah. Well, um, I, I believe I have a little bit of an in, and that is that I'm a professional biologist. So the talk that you uh, just saw, I actually gave a, a shortened version of it um, to the last meeting of the, uh, the annual general meeting of the Alberta Society of Professional Biologists. Um, so uh, I think, um, so when you think about rare plant survey, uh, and what's happened over the years with rare plant surveys, which is, I mean, that's a bread and butter for a lot of botanists out there yeah. doing work. Um, um, before the ANPC came up with their protocols, it was very haphazard about how, proto how surveys were being done. So I believe that if the AMS um, steps forward and puts together some reasonably doable collection and identification protocols. Um, and then we work toward, or we, you know, get that network of expertise and resources um, out to people, right? We show them that it's doable. And I think that's, that's where we got to start. And then, and then we need to get some regulators on board and, and get them in conversations like this one. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, where I'm screwed is I'm in the Northwest Territories and we don't have uh, quite that kind of uh, resource base, but you're giving me some ideas about angles I can pursue, which is very helpful. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. But. Yeah, I'm really hoping that, that in my lifetime, I might be able to accomplish this by getting together the resources, the mycological side of things and the professional biologist side of things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm involved in, with a lot of vascular plant work. I just, um, I've been spending a lot of my summer helping to update the Rare Vascular Plants of Alberta book. Um, and, and so I've, you know, I've got my, my fingers with the ANPC. I've got my fingers in, in a bunch of different things. And I'm kind of hoping that I might be able to be um, working with other people, but be one of the people that kind of brings these different worlds together and gets this going. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I see that I really have to go through through the plant section up here, which yeah. kind of gets short shrift. But anyway, that it's a start. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.
Any other questions or comments, guys? Uh, there are some uh, things in the chat box, Mike. Oh, okay. Well, let me... Yeah, that's that's a bit of... Could you just read them to me? Because I, I unfortunately, I can't see the chat box. Could you give me those questions? Well, you've probably got a more there. And anyway, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, this is... A lot of people think mushrooms are cute. <laughs> okay. Why so many vertebrates are at risk in Canada versus the U.S.? Oh, I'm not a vertebrate person, so I'm not sure I could answer that question. Uh, um, miss the reproductive talk. Can we watch it later? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Uh, the, the recording didn't work properly on the Zoom for me, so um that that did not happen so it's kind of one of those things that you have to be there i'm from saskatoon we have recently created a saskatchewan mycological working group and we are working to get the group rolling but how best can we help increase the science and knowledge of fungi yeah that's a really great question so i would encourage perhaps something like what the ams is doing um and that is to try and get um, some annual forays done where you bring in experts to do proper identifications and get lots of volunteers out there to bring them mushrooms and then start to get you know good lists because yeah the Saskatchewan um, like you m remember from that uh, picture um, or from the the chart uh, the data that I was able to get out of Saskatchewan was extremely sparse so the more data we have to work from the more that we can say you know there's there is important stuff going on here there are species that are truly rare um, and then we can start to justify putting together um, conservation plans for them is there a website that deals with this uh, project that you've been working on so that we can because I was really surprised when you said that there was somebody uh, documenting the species in the Northwest Territories oh yeah um, and it's like was that Scott Redhead by any chance or no it was, was not it was somebody that I'd actually never heard of their name before um, I'm sure that a lot of the people that were doing uh, the work hadn't heard my name before except for maybe the people in BC because uh, I know some of the people that were doing that. Um, so that, that's why I wanted to see the like I'd like because uh, I can't imagine that I wouldn't know who was doing that. But if they were only looking at the herba herbaria, herbaria, yeah, because herbaria is plural, right? Uh, yeah. How interesting. Yeah. Now, okay. It, I'm 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 now able to see all the questions, so I'm gonna delve into it. Yeah, um, so there's a student here at an Alberta high school interested in becoming a mycologist. Any advice to how you do how to do so? Um, I would say cultivate your interest by just learning about ecology and learning and spending some time. You know, the, the vast majority of my expertise I developed on my own just by picking mushrooms and working through keys and, and trying my best to identify them. Um, the um, uh, the opportunities for you in university, I would probably say U of A would be your best bet for your your university education. There is a, um, a fellow at U of A who is a lichenologist and has done some really groundbreaking work with lichenology. Um, so I would say that he wouldn't, his name is Toby Spreebill, and I would say that he wouldn't be a bad person to work under. Um, to, to get going and, and he's uh, got the genetics work as well as the ecological work uh, that he's been doing. So um, I would say that would probably be your best way to, to proceed. And it says, what Sandy Lake are those mushrooms from? It's the Sandy Lake in Alberta, in, in Northern Alberta. And a lot of those were collected by uh, the author of the, the most common ID book, her name was Helen okay. Schalswick-Berenson, and I probably pronounced that wrong. Um, 
and yeah, she was one of a, uh, a few really passionate mycologists in Alberta. She passed away a few years ago though. How can you become citizen scientists? Where and how can you submit DNA? Uh, well, it's a little bit more than I can answer in just a, a couple minutes, um, but I would say look at or Google the North America, uh, North American Mycoflora Project, and you should be able to find lots of information on the, the NAMA website um, about that project. Um, all right, so I think I've answered all the questions in the chat. Does anybody have anything else? Yeah, I, I, do, I have a question, a few questions. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm James from Saskatoon. Uh, and yeah, the, the mycological group is fairly new. And um, yeah, I think it's it's great idea to get to get some experts out here. Mm. Um, would you have any recommendations for like, you know, specific mycologists or like, I know Robert Rogers has a pretty uh, intensive book, like the fungal pharmacy and yeah, well, Robert's great with come with regards to medicinal stuff, and he's not that bad a field mycologist, but that's not really his specialty oh. identifying fungi. Yeah. Um, actually, probably the best mycologists in Alberta are. Um, I mean, there are some good ones. That um, there's a couple of good ones like uh, Suzanne Visser. I think she was on this chat here. Um, okay. I'm not sure I see her anymore. Um, so she's a great mycologist. Um, uh, there are some really good amateur mycologists. There's uh, one fellow, Martin Gnosis, he's a better field mycologist than I am. Um, the, I have the benefit of being more versed in the, the microscopic world, but when it comes to macroscopic stuff, he, yeah, he yeah. throws me under the bus. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, there's a few different people that uh, I, I can't throw together a massive list right now, but uh, I would be able to, once I, I really put my mind to it, yeah, we, we, we made it out for a foray uh, earlier this year uh, out near Redberry. I'm not sure which areas uh, you went in in Saskatchewan. Uh, I haven't been all over Saskatchewan, but I know I know pockets, certain pockets in, in sort of the species around the, those areas. Very interesting that majority of my records from Saskatchewan was also from a fellow named James. Um, <laughs> that had deposited a bunch in, in uh, their herbaria uh, around there. So it's kind of interesting. I don't think that was you though, was it? The last name doesn't seem familiar. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Okay. But um, have you, there's also like the, uh, I know like field guides are a great thing to invest in. I've only, in, I only have one field guide and I'd like to have a few. Um, and I know there's, I don't have data on my phone, but there's this, there's this app, a mushroom ID app. I'm not sure if you, yeah, yeah. Don't go with mushroom apps, please. Please, please don't go with mushroom apps. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what I would say, as far as identifying mushrooms, um, start with a field guide, but never end with a field guide because uh, as I mentioned, most of the field guides and names have changed, they're out of date, and there's been a lot more diversity found since those field guides were published. So field guides are a good starting place to say, okay, I have a pretty good idea that it's close to, you know, Satharellus candiolana, all right? So, you know, you, you have an idea that it's close to that, but then I would recommend you use some of the online keys that have been developed. Um, there's a, a website, mushroomexpert.com. He's got a lot of good ones. There's also um, the there's the keys to the um, keys to the mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest that have been developed for many mushroom species, and that's also available online. So then I would go. I would start with your field guide to get to the general group, and then to get more specifics, I would go to some of those online keys. Um, and then once you get more involved and you really want to know, then you might start investing in more group-specific books. Like I've got, um, I've got books that are specific to agaricus, um, books that are specific to tricholoma, to yeah, okay. yeah, ascomycetes, yeah. and to 
to um, I'm 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 asking for my birthday the one for truffles. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, wonderful. I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into your advice there, Michael. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, I, I started with Aurora's guidebook and yeah. I had a few others, okay? Yeah. And then as I, I learned more and saved my money, I, I probably have all the guidebooks that you have, like Bisset et al. and Bisset and Boyd, Bolitz, Trichilomas, Ascomycetes, Agaricus, yeah. um, and I use the keys. But uh, we're working on a North East Territories database of mushrooms right now and using all those keys and yeah. we're still stumped. And <laughs> this is really taking away from the topic of your presentation. But one of the things that we're finding um, is that we are better using the keys that relate to Eastern Canadian or Eastern North American species as opposed to Western North American species. And that's sort of like a, a travesty because <laughs> most people when they're identifying fungi in the Prairie Provinces use the Western guides or... Yes. So uh, could, you, could you please comment on that? Because it's making us crazy. And <laughs> we can't afford, we can, no, well, we've, we've got so many mushrooms that we can't, I, we can't get right down to, this is what it is. Yeah. And we don't have enough money in the budget to do major, major DNA or, mole or well, major d molecular analysis. Um, that, uh, which we call it citizen scientists, we, the Northwest Territories actually is the northernmost, or, um, province or whatever you want to call it that belongs to that association um but they would be swamped if we gave the species so could you could you please comment on that and yeah another avenue what would you suggest for another other than trying to tap into universities and scientists who are specifically working on the families of the troublesome mushroom troublesome fungi that we are finding yeah, that's, that is a challenge that we all face. So one of the problems is the, how you define East and West. Um, so most of us would say, most of us would say, we're Western Canada, right? Everything, say, West of Ontario is Western Canada. No, no, no. Um, but, but when you look at the identification guides, where they draw the line between East and West is the Rocky Mountains. That's right. Um, that's what we... That's, that's what we use. Like yeah. For However, project. so the complication there is that um, as far as the communication and collaboration between my <laughs> colleges go, it's more the Prairie Provinces in BC doing their thing and then Eastern, you know, provinces, that's Ontario and East doing their thing. So as far as the official classifications that the guys are using east and west is Rocky Mountain but as far as collaborations are concerned it tends to be the Prairie Provinces and BC working together so for example um, we have been represented as a mycological society on the Pacific Northwest Key Council which is a, the right. council oh, that developed yeah. those keys that I was talking about I have those two. <laughs> yeah. So those well, I, use, I, I use them. I'm sorry. I should say I use them. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Those keys were developed together with Albertans, even though it's a Pacific Northwest Key Council. Yeah. Um, so those keys are bringing together BC, Alberta, and perhaps other, um, you know, more traditionally Western Canadian provinces to come together to put those key together, keys together. But when you're look you're using a key that's in the scientific literature or in a more formal guide, like the ones you're talking about, um, the ones that we, we just talked about, then yes, the definition between East and West is, is different. And so it makes it complicated. When I do my IDs, I normally go through the Western key and then I go through the Eastern key yeah, and I see which one fits better. That's what, that's what I'm doing. And it's out of, well, it's because you, that's what you have. Well, that's what we have to do because yeah. you get stumped in, in the West. One thing I, I would like to also offer, but, because, but it's not quite a, it, 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 it helps us. Uh, Kathy Cripps has a really good publication out that has to, that deals with uh, fungi and altitude. 
and you can relate altitude to latitude for mm. us. Yeah. And so many, I should, I should say many, but many of the relationships of fungi to vegetation are depicted quite accurately in, in, in her book. And mm. that's not getting us the species. It's still not getting yeah. us. But no, thanks very much for, for those, those suggestions. Um, because, yeah, it's frustrating. Mm. Yeah, good. Oh, great. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, I've got one. I think I put it in the chat, but then we got disconnected okay. and I, I don't think it was answered, but I'll try okay. again. Um, so in thinking about surveying and kind of the potential future of that, do you see that there would be any possibility, maybe in a very far future, that you could kind of take a soil sample um, and it's probably, there's probably a whole mix of genetics in that, but would there be some way to, to be able to see what fungal species are beneath the surface just with kind of a simpler, well, simple sampling, but then totally complex genetically afterwards? Any future for that? Yeah, um, that's, that's a challenge because um, it's, it's doable. The technology's there. It, it, people are doing that nowadays, it, so it's it's not beyond the realm of, of, of possibility. The the trouble with that is, um, how do we possibly um, try to number one target macro fungi versus micro fungi? Because there's probably more micro fungi out there than there are macro. And the second problem is, how do we know where to sample and when we've done sufficient sampling? Right, it would be like trying to imagine doing a rare plant survey just by randomly throwing, uh, you know, cups in the forest and looking what's under the cup. Right, you're not going to get a proper um, idea of what's going on. You have to have people that are trained to be able to recognize this stuff if you're going to do a decent macrophages survey. It's it's going to be better doing it with the fruiting bodies, at least then you're getting, um, you're getting um, things that are a little bit more targeted to what you're looking for. Plus you're able to, uh, yeah, to get, get a better, you, you're not gonna have so much noise that you're, you're not gonna know what to do with it all. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a possibility. And maybe once genetics gets uh, a little bit cheaper to run and stuff, maybe that's going to be the direction it's going to go. And uh, as a follow-up, do you think there'll ever be any interest for microfungi or is that way too far away? Oh gosh, let's, let's go with, with at least a sexier fungi for now. <laughs> All right, and then hopefully maybe one day we might be able to get people slightly interested in mold that's going to look like something that's growing on the underside of their basement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, so I have a question in the chat here. Um, being from Labrador, anything in the West, <laughs> West is from anything past Quebec. <laughs> Um, and uh, asking about any thoughts on climate change impacting fungi. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, right now with the state of our science, um, the, the best we can do is kind of get an idea of how climate change is affecting forest ecosystems and then extrapolating that to say probably fungi are looking the same way. Um, but um, we, we don't know. And it could very well be that climate change is going to be significantly offsetting fungi from the species that they normally associate with. And we could see um, as ecosystems kind of move their way north or move their way up, up altitude wise, that, that gradient, that we could see fungi that lag behind and aren't able to move up with them. So there's, we're definitely, we definitely see that happen in other ecological relationships, um, that, that things don't always line up the way you think they, they would. Um, so it could very well be some really significant impacts on fungi, but yeah, the state of our information is, is so small. We're, 
Uh, often today we're at the, the snowflake on the tip of the iceberg when it comes to our knowledge of fungal ecology and, and, um, and what's going on, yeah. All right, any other questions before we wrap up here today? I had a quick question just about the, uh, with your study in the, <clears throat> the S1 and the S2, like the yeah. rare, the rare mushrooms, what, what classifies a uh, rare mushroom? Yeah, All so right. what, what, what did I use? So let, remember there is that ranking system, that NatureServe ranking system. So it's a, it's a bit of a calculator. You put your data in there and it spits something out. Um, uh -huh. But then what, whatever it spits out, let's say you put in only a couple of records from you know, far disparate parts of the province or both in the exact same part of the province, it's automatically gonna spit out a number like a one or a two, right? Because it's saying, oh yeah, there's not very much of them. So therefore yeah. um, it's important. So then you as a mycologist have to weigh that and you have to say, okay, is this species one that's, that we only have a couple of records of because of little surveying being done in that area because it's hard to recognize because it's a you know a cryptic fungus that's you know lives its life on the underside of logs and people don't see it or is it something that's fairly easy to recognize it's a f larger fungus that's easy you know got distinctive features and easier to separate from from similar related species and then you might be a little bit more confident in your ranking mm. At least that's what I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess my last question, did you find a lactarius indigo, a blue indigo? No, not, not from Alberta. No, that's so or, far only or, from Saskatchewan. Yeah, okay. But yeah, in Saskatchewan you did, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was actually, and, and that was interesting finding that um, because what really um, brought that out was an article. Normally, I don't use magazine articles as a source of information. I think I saw that. I think I saw this magazine article. You're yeah, and so I saw that magazine article, and I was able to to actually make some contacts there and actually get a little bit more into information about yeah. that particular species, much more than I had for any of the other records, um, just because it was such a, a unique thing that's going on with that mushroom. Yeah, I think uh, five, about five years ago when I got into foraging, I found uh, about 10 in one day and they wow. were really difficult because they were, they were in such a mossy forest that with leaves and moss and stuff, it was almost hard to even see the top of them. Mm -hmm. And for those that are, are, are trying to follow along, Lactarius indigo is a very unique sort of bright purpley colored mushroom um, that has become sort of a, a culinary um, uh, thing that people are really interested in um, because it you know very lends a very unique color to the dishes that it's it's cooked in and so far I think it's just uh, Saskatchewan that has really well-known populations yeah 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 to me it was like an avatar blue almost like just such yeah. a blue, like out of the avatar movie like st like, glow, <laughs> like it almost like it would glow in the dark it's so bright and apparently that color stays after cooking correct yeah yeah, yeah pretty much yeah maybe it's a little darker oh wow okay for, for, for a teaser for you guys lactarius indigo has been anecdotally reported by one of my geological colleagues up here in the barrens oh, wow. in the territories but that would date back to probably the mid to mid 70s to early 80s and all uh, since since you brought it up i'm trying to call a guy and say hey remember that blue <laughs> lactarius you told me about because he was showing it to me to say yeah like look at that man anyway that's really interesting yeah. Cool. And I want to say right now, I apologize to the other um, mycologists that I've forgotten all your names uh, that are working in Alberta. I'm uh, the first thing that goes in my mind when I'm got a lot of things going on in my brain is names. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there um, that yeah I know there are other mycologists and people that I know quite well that I'm just blanking on right now so please don't take that any offense to that <laughs> hmm. 
All right. Any more questions before we wrap up? I, I was just saying thank you. Yeah, this is a great, uh, great con yeah, webinar. Well, thank you, Stephen. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'd just make one comment, like down sure. the road, you know, Alberta Mycological Society and this new group in Saskatchewan, we could have a, like a, a joint foray. Yeah. we we'll see yeah. what our process is in Alberta and you could do something similar in Saskatchewan and get things going there. It's more Saskatchewan specific and to your interest in Saskatchewan. So. Yeah, I believe that last year we almost got something going and then and then s stuff fell through because I know I was, I was, I, I think I even had it in my calendar as a possible Saskatchewan foray. Um, but I don't recall exactly what happened with that, but I know that that something happened to, uh, to make that not end up happening. We have had uh, people in our club that are from Saskatchewan mm. that come to the forays in Alberta. And there also was at one time a Facebook group, the Saskatchewan Mycological Society or oh. something that we have tried to make contact with. Um, so it's good to see Saskatchewan starting again. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what happened to the Facebook group, if it's ever gotten closed or restarted. But yeah, we, we have always offered to these people that we occasionally see any help we can give them with getting their organization up and running. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I, and I, I would encourage any of you guys from other provinces to, who might be listening to this now or watching the recording to, um, to get in touch with us um, uh, at the Alberta Mycological Society through either our Facebook page or by contact, contacting us through our webpage and uh, and see if we can do some collaboration that would be so totally awesome oh dear i've got a, a question and a comment with regard to your presentation and first of all thank you so much i'm so glad i got notified of this presentation uh excellent um is it possible to access your presentation somehow so if I want to have our people at the government of the Northwest Territories, ENR, which is Energy and Natural Resources, be made aware of the situation. Like that's one of the great things. Your presentation is a really good microcosm of what's going on in Canada, to mm -hmm. some respects, North America and globally. And if there's any way we can snag your presentation or access it somehow. Yeah, so the Alberta Mycological Society does have a, uh, a YouTube um, yep. YouTube page, so uh, um, we're planning on putting this up there. Okay, very good. The second thing is the comment with regard to the question the gentleman had about uh, recording climate change and its relation to fungi. Hmm. One of the things that uh, this NWT database group is doing, they compiled what was in the herbaria with regard to NWT species and then through collection of fungi now uh -huh. they're doing a comparison to say okay in the herbaria these were specimens that were collected blah 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 these uh -huh. dates and this is what we're seeing now and that's yeah. just it's it's very uh restrictive because you can't cover all the northwest territories and you have the same problem in the other provinces but it would be a start i think as yeah. far as saying gee back in the i think our database goes back to the 60s that's when data fungi data was collect has was begun to be collected mm -hmm. um so at least you can go back that far so i just yeah. thought i'd comment on that yeah, and that that is great, and and that's why I I, I um, think things like the Alberta Forey that we've been doing here are are so important to try yes. and catalog that. But then it, the ultimate question when you do projects like that um, is it due to actual shifts in the species, or is it due to the abilities, collection abilities of the people that were doing it then and now? You know, there there's so you have uh, to. Uh, your your report, if you ever published it, would have to have all those caveats. Yeah. And I should call them caveats, but you you have, all of those features have to be taken into account because you also have the change in the forest ecosystem itself, mm -hmm. and, and 
you know, so, but yeah, it's, it, at least you might be a little bit of a start. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, anyway yeah, great. Great, Again. thanks, Dakota. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. <laughs> uh, Dakota, it's yep. Barb here. Um, do you know a Velma Sternberg? That's me. That's that's oh. me. Oh. Oh, but you're going by D Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the name of my computer, and I I like I like, oh. the, I like to fly under the radar, so I don't like my name. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice, oh, nice hi. to see. You. How are you doing? <laughs> we had at least five separate fruitings of uh, tricholoma, well, let's just call it pine mushroom because there's a huge dispute as to whether it's magna velare or merlianum or whatever it's going to be called now, but, but literally five different fruitings hmm. of that at, mushroom. At different times of the year? Yep, since the beginning of August. Wow. Yeah, and honestly, because we, uh, there's a few of us that are, shall we say, avid collectors of that mushroom. <laughs> And you would go out and you would find them and then there would be a lull and then we'd get another rainfall with the good, uh, we were lucky and we had lots of rain this year, but we had the good temperatures as well. And so there'd be a lull and then we'd get another rainfall and you'd say, yeah, you know, I think we better go out and have another look again. And there they'd be again. And I was out last Friday and I think this might have well, we had warm weather last weekend, so we might get another one. But I, I was pretty sure that what I saw last Friday was maybe the last fruiting of them. Um, but anyway, um, th anyway, that's actually the different fruitings of that species are reflected in different fruitings of our vegetables in our gardens. Like our, um, many of us have Saskatoon trees. And we've got two different fruitings of Saskatoons in our yards, like the same tree. And you've got a whole group of ripe Saskatoons. And right now I've got Saskatoons that I better pick before they freeze. Um, and now, I'm, I'm, I hate to interrupt, but I, I think yeah, we probably, sorry. this I'm is sorry. a great conversation, but uh, I'm not sure I'm everyone sorry. here is gonna relate to what you're talking about at this yeah, point. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, just before I, 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 I shut the, the presentation off, is there any other questions? All right, well, thank you everybody for attending and I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Feel free to give me a contact um, through the Alberta Mycological Society or through our Facebook page. Um, and, uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll hear from some of you guys and let's uh, get this agenda getting pushed forward and, uh, and talk to your local politicians about things like this yeah, if you have an opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you for attending today. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for your time and your knowledge and all that you're doing in the field. You're welcome. All right, well, have a great rest of your day. I'm gonna shut her down for the night. Have a good night.